Welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday in Advent. The theme for today is love. And our song of faith says, Jesus preached and practiced unconditional love. Love of God, love of neighbor, love of friend, love of enemy. And he commanded his followers to love one another as he had loved them. This is why we light the candle of love. There are four different kinds of love. Eros, erotic, passionate love. Philia, love of friends and equals. Storge, the love of parents for children. And agape, love of humankind. Before Jesus began his ministry among the people, it is Mary who embodied love for us. Love for a husband who stood by her. Love for the people who came to see the child a love she ponders in her heart, the love of a mother for her child, and the love of humankind made known in her song of love, the Magnificat. Today we focus on Mary, a woman connected to the ancient love from which we all sprang. Let us pray. Holy God, you loved us into being. You made us part of the web of life. Long before we knew you, you walked beside us. And still that was not enough for you. To know us, you became one of us and lived this life of joy and pain and peace and sorrow. We edge closer to the stable door, and when we celebrate once again that humble birth, that glorious night, your ancient love is with us. Amen.
scripture reading is the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. It's Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to divorce her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. The prophet had said, Look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she'd given birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Oh, mm -hmm.
We have this lovely crash that depicts the birth of Jesus. Nativity scenes like this one are a staple of the Christmas tradition. It is impossible to go through Christmas without seeing at least one in front of churches, in front of people's homes, on Christmas cards, in the sanctuary, and in our own homes. Did you know that the first nativity scene, like this one, was accredited to Francis of Assisi in 1223? For 800 years, the image of a lonely stable, far from town, where Mary and Joseph, accompanied by cattle and sheep, attend to a newly born baby in a manger, has been implanted in our imaginations for 800 years. All of our Christmas carols and traditions are born of this 800-year-old vision of what the birth of Christ was like. But hold on to your hats. In reality, Luke's Gospel doesn't even mention a stable, just a manger. In Luke we read, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place in the inn. There's no talk about a stable. It's not described. It doesn't say anything about sheep and cattle. It is more likely that the stable was actually a cave-like room, a lower room attached to the inn in which there was no more room. And Matthew's gospel tells us nothing except that Mary gave birth to a son who they named Jesus. No shepherds, no angels, no cattle lowing. In Mark and John's Gospel, the birth of Jesus is not even mentioned. For 800 years, we have imagined Joseph carefully attending to his wife in labor. But it is unlikely that he did such a thing. His religion would have forbidden him from being in the presence of a woman doing what women do. He would have done what was common practice. He would have gone looking for a midwife. In an ancient text from the year 145 called the Proto-Evangelium of James, we read a story that seems to be a little closer to how it might have actually been. It goes like this. And I, Joseph, saw a woman coming down from the hill country. And she said to me, O man, where are you going? And I said, I am seeking a Hebrew midwife. And she answered and said to me, Are you of Israel? And I said to her, Yes. And she said, And who is it that is bringing forth in the cave? And I said, A woman betrothed to me. And the midwife went away with him, and they stood in the place of the cave, and behold, a luminous cloud overshadowed the cave. And the midwife said, My soul has been magnified this day, because my eyes have seen strange things, because salvation has been brought forth to Israel. And immediately the cloud disappeared out of the cave, and a great light shone in the cave, so that the eyes could not bear it. And in a little, that light gradually decreased, until the infant appeared, and went and took the breast of his mother Mary. And the midwife cried out and said, This is a great day to me, because I have seen this strange sight. And the midwife went forth out of the cave, and Salome met her. And she said to Salome, Salome, I have seen a strange sight, something I want to relate to you. A virgin has brought forth a thing which her nature admits not of. I love the imagery of this story. The great light is not out in the field somewhere, but there in the cave with Mary lighting the way as the midwife coached her through the labor, and then diminishing when Jesus, the light of the world, came into it. And the midwife, who had probably attended dozens of births, brought many lives into the world, witnessed the intense innocence of a newborn, that midwife immediately recognizes this one as special, sacred. 
a thing which Mary's nature admits not of. Salvation has been brought forth to Israel, she says. Salvation is announced not by angels, but by a midwife. Women helping other women at the time of childbirth has been a part of women's culture and part of the fabric of community for time immemorial. But in the past couple of centuries, the role of the midwife changed dramatically. When my ancestors came to Ontario, in some settler communities, trained midwives from Europe were brought in to tend to the women. But in most places, midwives learned from each other. There was no formal training, no certificate or degree, just experience passed from woman to woman. And every community had someone who could attend on a birth. Throughout the 1800s, however, Organized professions and institutions took over the care of the sick and also the care of women giving birth. This was before OHIP, when those medical professionals and institutions were looking for customers. Competition arose between healthcare providers, between the physicians and the institutions and the midwives who had been operating and working in communities for time immemorial. The medical professionals began to call the midwives unscientific and accused them of relying on old wives' tales and superstitions instead of science. Over time, there was a gradual acceptance of the involvement of physicians, and by the 1900s, the use of hospitals for childbirth was instituted. In the latter half of the 1900s, a Medical Practice Act prohibited anyone but a physician from recovering fees for childbirth and midwives all but disappeared from the Canadian landscape. For women, the experience of birth became institutionalized. Gone was the sacred bond between mother and child as the baby was whisked away to the nursery to be viewed through the glass window. Gone was the primal fight for life as physicians regularly used anesthetic. Even feeding the baby was discouraged in favor of canned milk. By the 1970s, as the women's movement took hold, women realized the extraordinarily sacred experience of birth was being withheld from them. Longing for that sacred experience, parents and midwives formed an alliance that sought an alternative to medical hospital care. They formed relationships based on shared information, joint decision-making and responsibility for th this important family event arose, and they became well-informed, highly articulate and influential childbirth activists. An underground movement toward home births grew. In 1981, during a regular legislative review of the healthcare system in Ontario, the government received submissions from childbirth advocacy groups for changes to the way women were treated during labor and birth. In 1995, after a lengthy coroner's inquest into the death of a child during a home birth, the inquest recommended making midwifery care part of the province's healthcare system and to develop training, accreditation, and regulation of midwives. These two events, the legislative review and the coroner's inquest, were the catalyst for the return to midwifery care as an option for women giving birth. Today, there are 1,012 registered midwives in Ontario serving 250 communities. 18% of all births in Ontario take place under the care of a midwife. And hospital births are dramatically different from how they were when I was born. I remember my mother-in-law telling me when I was pregnant with my children that for all of her children, except for the one born in the 1970s, she was put completely under and missed the whole thing. She missed the glory and the wonder. She missed the miracle. She woke up groggy and sick 
and was handed a squalling baby. And then the baby was taken away and she was left groggy and sick. It was not the best experience for her. This shift from midwifery to institutionalized childbirth and back to midwifery makes me wonder, what if for the past 800 years, the story we told at Christmas was of a midwife experiencing the glory of God and announcing God's salvation. If that was our story, how different might things be? What would the world be like, I wonder, if that was our story? How blessed every birth, how sacred every child, how honored every woman, how humbled every man, how connected every parent to their child. I don't want to do away with the Christmas story, the story that we have. It's a beautiful story. And there is a deep richness in the story of the shepherds and the angels and the faithfulness of Joseph. But I also want to see it with eyes opened and ears attentive to hear Mary's story. The story of the woman who embodied love, brought love into the world. Knowing that she was not alone, nor had she any reason to be afraid under the skillful care of that nameless woman who experienced with her the sacredness of birth. Mary pondered in her heart this thing which her nature admits not of, this child of her womb and yet beyond her, this Christ she would nurture, this light she would protect, this salvation she carried, this Jesus, human and divine, hope of our lives, birthed into this world. Let us pray. Holy God, we find you in the stories passed from generation to generation, mother to new mother, father to son, friend to foe. Help us to see you in the story, to find truth among the images we share, to share that truth with the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Treasured seed, help 
Let us pray. Holy God, for all the times you have been midwife to our aspirations, we thank you. For all the times you have upset the status quo and introduced a new story, we thank you. For all the times you have been present, we thank you. For all the times you have been absent, sending us seeking after truth, we thank you. Holy God, God of sacred stories, we thank you for the story that brings us together, the story of a remarkable birth, love born, salvation coming into the world. For all those with aspirations waiting to be born, we pray. For all those waiting for things to change, we pray. For all those who feel alone in the crowd, we pray. For all those who seek after truth, we pray. For all those who do not know the story and for all those who tell it, we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
The living God is among you and within you. Go into the world boldly. Be brave so that the world may be at peace. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.